Yeah, I was trained as a computer scientist, <clears throat> and, I, and I was educated in statistics, uh, working with computational cognitive scientists who were trying to explain common sense reasoning in humans using Bayesian probability. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about, and, and this quote is sort of along those lines. Um, now, of course, you've probably read a lot about how humans are irrational, etc. But the program of this research was showing that the ways in which we were rational was sort of rational. We were confronting our bounded rationality and doing kind of optimal allocation of resources, things like that, et cetera. Anyways, I'm not going to go into that sort of stuff, but that's the, that's the background. Um, uh, but I took the kind of inspiration for the uh, outline of the tutorial uh, from a, uh, a book chapter that I wrote with uh, two, two of my colleagues for the Turing Centennial. And you'll, you'll, you'll see uh, later a few mentions of Turing. I won't dwell on it very much. Uh, but the idea is that we're going to take a slightly unorthodox approach to introducing Bayesian probability. In particular, we're going to, uh, when we can, think about distributions as programs. Hopefully, I'm not sure if that will be more natural or less natural to this audience. We'll see. Uh, <clears throat> you just want to learn statistics. All right. So. So the goal of this tutorial, at least what I was told to do, or maybe I wasn't told to do this, but when I was preparing these slides, this is what I thought I had to do, was to give uh, a Bayesian perspective on learning. Uh, so there's two, two quotes, or two things in scare quotes here. One is Bayesian perspective, one is learning. And, and both of these, I think, are quite vague. And so I'm going to uh, attempt to give a short definition. So if, I'll start with Bayesian perspective. So my understanding is that yesterday you heard uh, two Two people speak for six hours on uh, computational learning theory and statistical learning theory, which is, these are frequentist, frequentist theories. Uh, uh, and in the frequentist setting, probability has a, has a different meaning than it does in the Bayesian perspective. So in the frequentist setting, probability is a limiting relative frequency uh, of events related to a sequence of independent and identical experiments. And so you study estimators and what the probabilities are, well, if I use this estimator many, many times in similar situations, I want to be able to prove some property of this large collection of runs. Whereas Bayesian probability is different. Bayesian probability is, in some sense, a more general view, though in a way they kind of come back and uh, meet each other again, in, in a sense through something called the kind of DeFinetti's theorem, but never mind that for now. So probability is meant to represent a de degree of belief. There need not be any sort of experiment in sight that's being repeated. So it's the idea that probability can be an extension of logic. So rather than just a Boolean value, something's true or false, now you have these intermediate degrees. And this is representing, uh, this, like I said, a degree of belief. So if you're certain something is not the case, it's probability zero. If you're certain it is the case, it's one, and then things are intermediate. So it makes sense for me to say that I will fly to Vilnius tomorrow and, and have that be some number. Uh, and there's no multiple worlds or anything like that. Right? And the 97 here was, is sort of capturing the idea that, well, it's almost certain, but there are some contingencies. Like, for example, I might have to fly home to Canada. Uh, but it's logically impossible for me to fly to Canada and Vilnius just because they're too far away and there's no chance I would be able to f go to both countries in one day. So that's logical impossibility, so I have zero. I guess I didn't account for time travel or something. And then the power, I'd say, of, of having probabilities is uh, forming conditional probabilities, which is what this bar is. So this bar says, well, I've... Uh, I've I, ha I want to restrict my attention to those worlds in which uh, this event has happened. So Tom has a fever and muscle aches and it's winter. And then I want to ask now in this reduced world whether Tom has a flu. And that might be high. But then if I switch the month around, then it's unlikely it's still flu. So this is, this is sort of the... Uh, <clears throat> it's this type of reason that I think has people interested in, in learning. It's just the idea that you can automate things which uh, relate to the idea of common sense. 
And if you could empower computers to be able to reason in common sense ways, then this would be very powerful and they could solve many interesting tasks, et cetera. And then there's things that are not even common sense, like just sifting through mounds and mounds of data that no human has any hope of understanding. That's also interesting too, but um, I think it's often less interesting. So another difference with, uh, say, the frequentist interpretation of probability, so in the free, in the, with, with the Bayesian one, so in the frequentist setting, probabilities are defined relative to a sequence of experiments that are sort of external and, 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 and have this kind of objective sound to them. You're measuring some kind of physical property of the world. Many of the people who developed Bayesian statistics rejected wholly this way of thinking that, that probabilities were objective in any way. Um, so sometimes Bayesian probabilities are referred to as uh, personal or subjective. So I can have, these might be my probability judgments. They'd be different. They don't have to be the same as yours. And that's not a contradiction. But then there's an interesting phenomenon, like for, for example, the fact that two people with different probability judgments and then f faced with more and more evidence of something, generally, though it's not always the case, you can, you can construct situations where this is not the case, but generally their, their probabilities will then converge and they'll come to agreement. One way for that not to happen is that one person is certain the evidence is false or misleading, and the other person is certain it's lead, uh, not misleading, right? Kind of like in the US. <clears throat> so, uh, so, so there are probably, well, let's see. Uh, I, I'd say one of the key structures in Bayesian probability is that of a joint distribution. So I'm already up here referring to, well, it's sort of, sort of amorphous what I'm referring to up here, but I might be very, try to be much clearer and introduce variables representing different Boolean valued uh, events. And then joint distribution is a speci specification of probabilities for all possible uh, configurations of those variables. And from this set of probabilities, I can, answer, I can answer straight up questions like this. I can answer conditional questions, et cetera. Uh, and so this joint distribution, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite unlike, say, classification, which you prob I'm guessing you probably studied that extensively the last, yesterday. So in classification, you're looking for a mapping from images to a, to a label that, say, has low population risk. Your access to, your, your only hope is minimizing empirical risk or some, some kind of regularized surrogate of that. So that's, yeah, that's your starting point. But at the end of the day, you learn that rule. Whereas, for example, if you were to learn a joint distribution over the image and the label, that would permit you to not only, say, ask for judgment as to which labels are likely given the image, but also, given the label, generate for me a typical image that has that label, right? So this, in some sense, the, the structures that we're often after in Bayesian statistics are more ambitious ones. Vapnik is famous, who is, uh, I guess, uh, one of the fathers of statistical learning theory. Vapnik was famous for saying, don't attempt to learn the distribution and sort of you're, off, you're often after a much simpler object, like say a classification function. Don't go, don't go through this incredibly hard stage. Well, in, in some sense, Bayesianism goes through that hard stage. And, it's, and maybe there's a couple things you could say. Well, oftentimes you can do better just directly trying to learn the one thing you're trying to learn. But then you often find that uh, you're in situations where you don't just need one thing. You need many things. And so there's going to be a running example later on of medical diagnosis where maybe the symptoms are changing, maybe the, uh, and, and so, uh, or maybe you want to flip the model around and generate plausible, plausible uh, symptoms given diseases, et cetera. There's, all, there's kind of a combinatorial number of things you could do with the joint distribution. Say much, much richer set of things than you could do with a, a classification function. Like for example, I learned a classification function on images. But now I have an image where I'm like missing half the image. What do I do? All right? for, the for the joint distribution, this is easy. I've just observed the variables associated with one half of the image. Right? And I some somehow the probability calculus is going to average over and deal with the part of the image I haven't seen. Whereas the classification function you've learned, you have to hand it a whole image. So missing data is like, a, I say, a real place where uh, Bayesian ideas are powerful. <clears throat> So 
So this is, uh, this is all I would say, I would call it inference. And these words, these words, are, uh, these words are often toffed, tossed around, but maybe they also have jargon. There's a, they're, they're also jargon. So this is what I would call inference, if I was using the word in a jargony way. And then there's a the question, what is learning? <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, you know, this, I, it's, it's, it's uh, almost impossible to give a satisfactory answer to what is learning, I think. Um, uh, but if you think about uh, you know IID data that kind of setting, then then you could say, well, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be dealing with many patients and symptoms. If I knew the true distribution, then I could answer all sorts of questions. I could, I could perform inferences, all number of inferences. But maybe I don't know p, so that's a learning problem. That's a classic one. All right, so we don't know the p. We want to learn it from the data, and necessarily this leap from data to uh, the distribution requires some strong assumptions. We don't, in some sense, we don't really solve the, the problem of induction here. We just kind of assume it away, give ourselves enough structure, IID, NIST, and things like this. But, you know, we might be learning to classify images. That's what you talked about yesterday, probably. Um, you might be learning to diagnose, and now I want a joint distribution on, on these things. It allows me to, say, have partial observations. I see some of the symptoms, not all of them. So when I say learn a P, what do I mean by that? Well, there's no, you know, there's no, there's nothing, there's nothing magical here. There's nothing, uh, there's, there's no getting something from nothing. Generally, you are fixing some parametric family. So here now I've introduced this uh, index theta. Maybe it comes in a vector space. Maybe it's infinite dimensional. It's not so important for this talk. Um, and then you're after the true or often more accurately best parameter in some sense you have to formalize theta star. So <clears throat> Bayesianism is computationally hard. Right? So almost always in practice you're you're cutting some corner. I'm the the, the development I'm going to go over today is a rather like uh, orthodox one I'd say. So you might, you might hear someone talk about a fully Bayesian approach, or and then, and then there's, then there's uh, empirical Bayes and things like this. So I'd say a fully Bayesian one is where there's no quantity left that you're uncertain about. Everything that you're uncertain about has been integrated into your probability distribution. You've, you've, you're modeling it as a random variable, and you're capturing your uncertainty about this uncertain quantity by a probability distribution. And then one, once everything is inside a massive probability distribution, and there's only one thing left to do, which is to start conditioning on data. And once you start conditioning on some data, then your beliefs are going to change elsewhere. And what you're looking for, just like in a statistical setting where you rely upon concentration of measure, in the, in the, in the Bayesian setting, you're looking for concentration of posterior probability on some event. And that is meant to represent kind of increasing certainty as this, hopefully something that you were trying to become certain about. Uh, so, in machine learning, there's often a distinction made between inference and learning because they generally employ different algorithms and tools. Uh, and I'd say modern Bayesianism also maintains this distinction. But I'm going to give you a, the pure Bayesian view, where after I've incorporated everything into my probability distribution, then all that remains is probabilistic inference. All right. And, and it may, depending on how much time I have at the end, maybe I'll return to dwell on that. Uh, and then, you know, just to point back to yesterday, though I wasn't there yesterday, so I just keep referring to yesterday, just imagining what he taught you since, you know, I'm familiar with that material. But um, in the frequentist approach, you wouldn't model, uh, say, this this quantity here, which is also you know, presumed unknown, you wouldn't model that as a random variable and put a distribution on it. You would develop estimators and, and prove universally quantified statements saying, no matter what the value of that thing, I do something reasonable. Right? And then you get a probability, which is about if I run this, if I use this sampler 100 times, I use this estimator 1,000 times in a row, then actually 99% of the time it's going to do something sensible. Right? That's the type of theorem you're dealing with. Whereas like S in the Bayesian world, you have the data. I want to talk about this data. I don't want to talk about sampling properties. I just want to figure out what my, this data tells me. You're not worried about how well what you're doing necessarily 
works in other situations. You're worried about this situation. Seems very logical, uh, but it's subtle. And I'm not going to I'm not going to get too philosophical here. All right. So if it's uh, so, you, so may, maybe you're getting the, maybe you're getting the sense that the Bayesian framework is conceptually simple, and I think that's the main selling point of it. That's why it has. Uh, that, that in the advent of computation, which made it actually feasible to carry out Bayesian analysis, has let, I think that's, that's a reason for its, uh, its popularity and, and also sort of the kind of the r religious fervor that many of its uh, advocates bring. Right? How can something so conceptually simple be wrong? Everyone should be doing this. That frequentist stuff is way too hard. <clears throat> and, I, and, I, and I suspect that this will seem much easier than yesterday's stuff. Per, you know, Rademacher complexity and things like this. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so in the Bayesian framework, you're representing all knowledge in terms of mathematical distributions. That might seem a bit uh, funny to think about. I'll give you a few examples in a minute. And then evidence is going to be incorporated by probabilistic conditioning. So everything, everything is in a distribution, and so the, the only way I kind of take advantage of uh, new facts is I modify my distribution. And the way to do that is by conditioning. Oh, I learned it's raining. OK. Condition, throw away everything but the worlds where it's raining. All right? And then I updated, updated probabilities. <clears throat> so the, the tweak and the thing's a bit unusual. Um, is that I'm going to introduce this Bayesian framework using <clears throat> a computational framework, uh, which for the purpose of this talk I'm calling universal stochastic inference. So uh, probabil probabilistic and stochastic, I, probably those are often synonyms, so I'm, going to, I'm distinguishing here. Stochastic means uh, kind of we're going to be talking about algorithms that are random, randomized. <clears throat> All right, and so the main three steps here in this framework and how it connects to Bayesian, the Bayesian framework is that distributions are going to be represented by programs. Evidence is going to be represented by predicates, so that take in worlds and say yes or no, or true or false, to whether they match the evidence. And then conditioning is going to be a, it's going to be a higher order procedure that acts on these previous two structures. A program representing kind of a, a body of knowledge and evidence represented by predicates. And the way that, in particular, that programs are going to represent distributions is by being simulators. <clears throat> so a program P represents a distribution mu by simulating mu, meaning generating a random output X whose distribution is mu. So this, this programs are going to have access to randomness. If you'd like a formal model to rest your intuition on, you can think about a probabilistic Turing machine or what I'm going to use in this talk, Python with a pseudo-random number generator which you can pretend is real. Not so important. <clears throat> uh, so if you do have a machi machine learning background, th this perspective, di um, uh, distributions as programs, is, is closely related to an, an, a number of subfields of machine learning. One that's very closely tied and really is the kind of starting point for this is probabilistic program, pr probabilistic programming, <clears throat> where you're taking, uh, you know, the types of structures many of you study, um, thinking about them with random choice and, uh, and often adding in constructs to perform probabilistic conditioning. This is very closely related to something called approximate Bayesian computation, which is a rich source of algorithms that are probably right for PL people to look at. And then in machine learning, there's a kind of a parallel world called implicit generative models that does very much the same sort of things as ABC but rests on slightly different algorithms. Okay. So while, while ABC rests on a Monte Carlo base, implicit generative models rests on something called a variational inference foundation. I don't expect that to mean anything to, to, uh, to you, but don't worry about it. All right, so <clears throat> this, the structure of the tutorial is, uh, well, it's going to center around this higher order procedure, which uh, we'll call query. Uh, which is going to implement this simple but uh, relatively generic form of probabilistic conditioning. So query acts on other programs, or it's going to be Python procedures. And then by using query, we'll be able to describe instances of inference, learning, uh, 
Uh, I said decision making here. I don't think I'm going to get to the decision making stuff, but I have some slides if necessary. <clears throat> uh, and then I'm going to go through inference and learning and probably not decision making uh, using an extended example of medical diagnosis, which is like the classic AI problem. <clears throat> and it's nice because it has, uh, you can start off with some inference and then you can get to learning and there's several layers of learning you can go through. And I'm going to uh, basically be, to be able to tell you guys about a number of the classical phenomena that if anyone, you know, if you took a class in Bayesianism, then you would probably, you know, uh, <clears throat> ticking off these phenomena would be like part of the course. And so we'll do, it, do that today. <clears throat> and then also... Uh, <clears throat> You may, you may you'll, you'll, well, I'm not going to dwell on this much to the talk unless I remember to do so, but uh, I think many people have the conception that machines are rather rigid, etc., cetera, um, and maybe far away from displaying sort of common sense uh, behavior. Well, in this medical diagnosis example, once we get sort of the full thing going and thinking about the full thing, there's some surprisingly complex behavior that the simple model I'm going to show you can exhibit. And so <clears throat> uh, I think, I mean, at some level, that's, that's the basis for the interest in machine learning and, and, and uh, statistical AI. All right. So here's the uh, first example. So we're just leaping right in. So this is a uh, piece of code in Python with some procedures that are not typical to Python defined elsewhere, and you'll just have to imagine what they do. So one of those procedures is uh, this Bernoulli P. This is a piece of code when you run it, it hands you a 0 or a 1. It hands you a 1 with probability P. And I'm being a little bit redundant, a little bit circular here. I'm saying probability. <clears throat> Uh, and probably the most natural way to think about this is if I run this little snippet of code 100 times, then p fraction of them are going to be one. Are going to be one. And I'm not going to dwell on the circularity of this. <clears throat> All right, so, so what does this piece of code do? Well, uh, this is a uh, list comprehension. So n times, I'm going to call Bernoulli p, it's going to put it in a list, and I'm going to sum it up. So what do I get? I got a number between uh, 0 and n. <clears throat> So that's what this program is returning, a random number between 0 and n. And of course, that random number has a distribution. And so there's also a distribution of the, there's also, I can also ask for the distribution of the output. But notice, I'm also passing in two parameters. So I'm really defining a family of, family of distributions. Uh, in probability theory, this is often called a, called a probability kernel or Markov kernel. So this would be a Markov kernel from naturals cross unit interval to di distributions on naturals, I suppose or it's not naturals, integers. Uh, and this particular family is a binomial family. All right, so that's all probability theory, but then I can also give it a statistical interpretation, which is that this piece of code, I can use it to build statistical models of the number of successes among n independent and identical experiments. Right? And, the, and, and just like with ordinary programming, where you have compositionality, and means of combination, et cetera, we're going to be able build uh, more interesting models from pieces, right? That's the whole idea. And one of the nice things about thinking about programs as representing distributions is then it's not just lip service. You can actually combine programs and get bigger programs. So let me just do that right now, give myself some space, and introduce a procedure called randomized trial. So at the end of the day, randomized trial is going to return a pair of numbers. It's going to return uh, a call to binomial with 100 and a variable called p control. And the second element of the tuple is going to be a call to binomial 10 and p treatment. So what is this going to return? It's going to return a pair of natural numbers between 0 and 100 and 0 to 10. Now I had these, I had these quantities here. So what I'm thinking about now is a statistical model for a randomized trial. Right, and so what am I after? I'm after what is the, what is the um, effectiveness of, say, a treatment? And what is the baseline? What is kind of the, uh, what's the probability that people spontaneously uh, uh, become free of the disease when they're in the control group? So if I'm being Bayesian, then I have to put probability distributions on these. <clears throat> 
In the setting yesterday, you might have built estimators, and you might have sought unbiased minimum variance estimators. You probably didn't talk about that. It's far too classical. But in the Bayesian setting, I have these two unknown quantities, and I'm going to put distributions. And I'll just put something very simple. I'm going to assume they're, I'm going to assume, and you know, one could argue whether this is really the case, but I could say I, I'm totally uncertain. I'm going to rep rep represent my total uncertainty by uniform distributions on the unit interval. I have no idea, and I don't want to, and, and, and oftentimes when people use such distributions, they kind of talk about, um, I don't want to bias it at all. I want to choose vague priors, et cetera. That's not a very Bayesian thing to do. So I'm going to take the stance that these are representing my total uncertainty as to the values of these two parameters. All right. All right, so this represents a Bayesian model of a randomized trial. So what can I do? Well, I have a... And this is one of the nice things about having distributions represented by code. I can run it. So the first thing that I do, or the first thing that happens when I run randomized trials, I sample twice from uh, a uniform random, I sample twice from uh, the, the uh, uniform distribution. And then, I and then I pass those numbers into binomial. And at the end of the day, I maybe get a 71 and 9 out. Right? Now, I... I ran the simulation, so I actually know what those two values were. Um, it's 0.67 and 0.86. And uh, not so surprisingly, these are kind of like small perturbations of these, right? This is out of 100, this is out of 10, that's why they're on different scales. <clears throat> so that's simulation. That's, and that's also the easy direction in a sense, because I've written an, an efficient program and so I can run it. So statistics is often about the other direction. So not, I didn't run the program and got 71 and 9, but rather someone came to me and said, 71 people in the control group spontaneously healed and 9 in the treatment group spontaneously healed. And then what they want to know is, what happened to get me here? All right, so that's inference. All right, and what we're going to do is calculate distributions on these quantities. And so in this case, these distributions represent our these are posterior distributions, and I can represent them separately rather than on a two-dimensional space because um, these are independent of each other now because I'm sampling, the, the semantics of the language says that this uniform bears no relationship to this uniform, and these two, these two computations are also independent. So the posterior is going to factorize, and so I can just give you a posterior for the P control and a posterior for the P treatment. Now, whether or not you decide to uh, invest a billion dollars and ship this drug is going to depend on how comfortable you are with the overlap there, right? And so probably this is not enough evidence. You probably, probably have to do a bit, more, uh, a bit more experimentation. All right, so that's an example. So, all right, so, so, so I, I've, get, I, I've talked about inference, but let's talk about this higher order procedure um, that I've been alluding to. All right, so this is query. It takes in two arguments. The first one, the type of the first one takes in uh, nothing and hands you something in S. And, uh, oops, it shouldn't be predicate, but checker. Um, and checker takes in something in S and returns a Boolean. And this computation is pretty simple. <clears throat> I start off with this flag false, and I'm going to keep running this loop until accept becomes true. What do I do each time? I ask the guesser for a guess, I check the guess, and if it checks out, I return it. If not, I repeat. So that's pretty simple. So let's uh, think about what it does quickly. All right, so the first sanity check. So if I have a trivial predicate, so this is a procedure which uh, takes an argument which I'm not even going to bother to name because I always return true. And then guesser is going to have the same semantics as query guesser and this trivial predicate. Why? Because <clears throat> I'm going to make my first guess, and then it's going to, this checker's not even going to look at it, it's going to immediately accept it, so I'm just going to pass back. All right? So that's that equivalence there. So this is a slightly more interesting one. Uh, I have a procedure N, no arguments, so this, is, looks like a, this looks like a guesser in terms of its type. And this is going to sample a uniform integer in the range uh, 1 to 180. <laughs> Or maybe it's 1 to 179. I can never remember with Python. Let's assume it's 180. 
Uh, and then I'm, then I'm going to consider the predicate div 235, which given an integer uh, reports back whether it's divisible by 2 or accepts it, um, return, returning true if it's divisible by, by 2, uh, 3, I meant to say and, 2, 3, 2, and 3, and 5. All right, so what's, let's assume that's and. So what's the meaning of uh, query and in div 235? So we can just imagine running this computation. It's going to come through. It's going to make a guess. It's going to guess an integer. Basically, it's going to keep guessing integers. And the, the first time it's going to leave this loop is when it hits something that's simultaneously div divisible by uh, 2, 3, and 5. So something like 30, 60, 90, and these, these types of numbers, right? <clears throat> and indeed, if you think about it, OK, so I can write down the, uh, the eight or so numbers that could possibly show up. And then I think about my. I think about my guesser. My guesser placed uh, exactly the same probability mass on each of these numbers. And so indeed, the result of this, the, the meaning of this expression is going to be a uniform distribution on those numbers that are divisible by 2, 3, and 5. All right, so what, what, what do we have here? We have, we have a procedure representing, it's a higher order procedure representing conditioning. So um, it's easiest to describe what it does when the checker doesn't itself consume any randomness, so it's just deterministic. So in that case, we can think about query taking in a representation of a distribution, a representation of a, a predicate, and then what is a return but a condition distribution. And this is just the kind of ordinary elementary definition of conditioning on a set. So I take my world condition on A, that means, um, so if I have some event B, then B condition on A is the probability of B and A divided by the probability of A. And this is meaningful only if P of A is greater than zero. And what that corresponds to is the possibility that given what guesser is giving me, it better be the case that checker has some possibility of returning true, or I'm just going to sit here and loop forever. So that's exactly caught by this condition here. So provided that I eventually will escape this loop with probability one, then, then I, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm in the good part of this map. All right. So, so the fundamental computation underlying Bayesian inference is this is, can be thought of or modeled as or usefully thought of as this particular stochastic inference pr pr uh, problem. So the input is this guesser and checker, and the output is a sample from the same distribution as this program. Not necessarily run this program. This program can be heinously slow. But this defines the semantics, and now you go off and do something smarter. Right, so then now let me just give you a little, a little bit of a, 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 a rubric. So you hear about prior distribution. The analog in this world is that's a distribution of the output of guesser. The term likelihood of some particular quantity g that's the probability that checker, when handed the value g, returns true. And posterior distribution, that's the distribution of guess at this point in the program. Now, uh, there's actually quite a bit more flexibility in terms of how you use query. And how you use it might not exactly line up with what statisticians think about as the prior likelihood and posterior. But actually, the, the, uh, these terms are uh, really imports from the frequentist theory. So when you kind of approach the problem of statistical inference from the frequentist world, you have a model which is thought about as a probability kernel from a space of parameters to a space of distributions on a sample space. Now you're trying to make inference as to the parameter that's responsible for generating all this data from some distribution that's indexed by, let's say, some parameter. And so, so the, to move this into the Bayesian setting, I put a prior distribution on this parameter, and then I calculate the posterior. And mo usually you're calculating the posterior because all quantities you might possibly be interested follow from calculating that posterior. So it's like a, it's a step that's not, you know, it, you can always start with that step and you haven't uh, done something totally useless. Um, but it's perfectly fine for the, for the Bayesian to totally ignore this distinction between model and parameter and just put a distribution on data and, and just perform condi probabilistic conditioning. And you'll see that view more uh, a bit later. All right, so let me, let me go through, let me go through uh, an example, and then I'll pause for uh, questions, if there are any. So, uh, 
Let's think about, the, you know, this is like the quintessential statistical problem. All right, so here's my, here's, here's the uh, computation performed by query. And uh, I'm asked, so I, I'm, I'm given some, uh, the prefix of some sequence, binary sequence, x1 through xn. And I'm meant to report a probability that xn plus 1 is equal to 1. Well, I mean, that's woefully underspecified. <clears throat> it could be anything, really. And so, uh, you know, the starting point of this is some sort of very strong assumption like, okay, I'm going to assume that um, the sequence of random variables x1, x2, dot, 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 uh, I'm going to assume that uh, the numbering is not important. And actually that one step there, which is a kind of a statement about exchangeability, is enough to uh, justify the following model. All right, so say I see 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. What's the next thing? All right, so <clears throat> I could say, okay, I, I believe that these are, these are conditionally independent draws. There's some coin or there's some bias. I don't know what it is. If I only knew that bias, and these would just look like uh, biased uh, rolls of a two-sided die or a thumbtack or something um, <clears throat> or coin. So... The unknown quantity here is that uh, this, this bias, which I do not know. And so I'm going to introduce it in my guesser and put a distribution on it. And I'm going to say uniform distribution because I'm expressing total uncertainty. Now, what's the checker going to do? So the checker is responsible for incorporating the evidence. So what the checker is going to do is it's going to call Bernoulli, which when you pass it a second parameter means that it produces a list. A, a list of IID replicates. So, right, so this, this, this evaluates to a, a length five list, each of them an independent uh, Bernoulli uh, random variable with mean p. And then what do I do? I compare it to the actual data. So that's checker. <clears throat> All right, so what does this do? <clears throat> so I can run this. Uh, I think this is 10 times, and I've plotted a histogram here, the values of P that popped out. Um, there's, a little, some, there's some kind of cl uh, clustering going on here because I'm seeing twos. Counts of twos. And let's run it a bit longer. It's like 100 times. Let's run it 1,000 times, or maybe this is 10,000 times. All right, so then some shape is showing up there. And if, I ran this, if I ran this experiment again 10,000 times, the exact same shape would show up. All right, so, well, so evidently I'm converging to something, and now I'm kind of playing with this distinction between limiting relative frequencies and probabilities as beliefs. This is a Monte Carlo simulation, so I'm kind of resting on the, the interpretation of probability here as a limiting relative frequency. <clears throat> so the semantics of this computation with these two procedures as guesser and checker is a distribution. This happens to be uh, a beta distribution. I can tell you right now it's a beta 2... Um, <clears throat> so this is a beta 2-5 distribution. So uh, what's going on here, and can we uh, analyze this a bit more closely? And I'm bothering to do this because um, the rest of the talk is going to reuse this particular submodel over and over, so it's kind of worth dwelling on it a little bit. And then after I go through this, we'll pause. <clears throat> All right, so it's useful, it's useful immediately to uh, introduce this variable s, which is the uh, sum of all the coins that, coins that you've seen so far. So, of course, if I sum up things that are 0 and 1, then this is just giving, giving me a count for how many 1s there are. So s is how many 1s. And then I'm going to introduce a uniformly distributed random variable. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, since it's uniformly uh, random, for any el element t in the unit interval, the probability that u is less than that value t is t. That's what it means to be uniform. <clears throat> so you can ask, and this is like maybe the first thing you have to figure out when you're trying to think about what is the query algorithm going to do. You have to kind of ask, how likely is it for a particular value to escape that while loop? That's the only hope you have of ever seeing this value. So understanding what it takes to escape this loop is fundamental understanding what this computation does. And if, if you recall, this is what I called earlier the likelihood. So we're calculating the likelihood. All right, so checker 
if I handed a pair T and X, now why am I looking at T's and X's? Um, uh, oh, I see these don't exactly agree with each other. So let's, so the computation here is doing something slightly differently. It is um, going to return P and Bernoulli P. So a pair of P and Bernoulli P. And then the question would be, given X1 through Xn, uh, predict Xn plus 1. Okay, so <clears throat> what, is, what, is the po what is the likelihood or what is the probability that Tx is checked and, and it becomes true? Well, checker only looks at the first quantity. It's going to take this probability value T, flip five more coins and check to see what happens. Right, so you can ask, all right, what's the probability that I have, say, five, uh, for all, for, say, this index is over five things. Each one of those five things is less than T. And why have I done that? Because that, that's my, <clears throat> that, that's how I can generate a coin with probability T. I can compare a uniform random quantity to the threshold T. All right, so I have a probability T coin coming in. I flip, say, five coins, and whenever it comes up, uh, zero or one that had better match. Th sorry, this 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 is this UI is less than T if and only if XI is equal to one. So this is just a this is just a way to, to write down the event that I exactly match the data, and then you can just do a little bit of um, moving variables around to work out that this probability can be written as T to the S and one minus T to N minus S. So this is accounting for the ones that I saw. What's the probability of one? It's a T. So I saw S of them. And they're independent, so that, that, that contributes a 2 to the s. And then there are n minus s zeros, and this can, that's what this term is contributing, 1 minus t to the n minus s. All right? Now, just to give you a feeling for what this function looks like, th so this is not a probability distribution. This is a likelihood. Likelihoods, for example, do not integrate to 1. Okay? <clears throat> so let's consider that I have n examples, and I either see 1 head, 3 heads, or 5 heads. So these are our plots of these likelihood functions. Now you might have seen, I think I saw some markers over here. Let's make sure. They're for this. Okay, yeah, don't write on the whiteboard. This is fine. So uh, <clears throat> if, you've, if you've, done, you've done some studying on yourself, by yourself on this stuff, you've maybe seen something like this. Right, as this is a Bayes rule in the context of Bayesian statistics. <clears throat> All right, so what's uh, what's that? So so here's the likelihood, and here's my likelihood. Now, what was my prior? My prior was flat. So actually, in this particular case, this shape is also representing, though it's not normalized, uh, what the posterior looks like. So. <clears throat> Um, so if I saw among six tosses, five of them coming up heads, then I'm actually reasonably certain that the probability is in this region. If it's one head out of six, I'm reasonably certain the probability is in this region. If it's three out of six comes heads, then I'm actually less certain where it is. There's more variance here if you come right down the middle at one, one half. Right? So these distributions have different widths, and that's essential. These two have the same width. Of course, it's symmetric, as you'd expect. All right, so that's if I apply Bayes' rule. How about the computation? I can think about the computation that's performed. We can just make sure it agrees with uh, what we know from, say, applying Bayes' rule and, and, and computing with probabilities. All right, so <clears throat> this, is, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is checker when I've uh, plugged in a fixed constant. <clears throat> um, and it's going to be useful this computation to ask, okay, what's the probability that the checker uh, accepts if I on average, so not for a particular value of t, but for a randomly chosen t between 0 and 1. So if you recall, my prior on t was uniform. So I can ask, okay, so I imagine, okay, what's the probability that I match the five pieces of evidence if I pass in a random probability? Well, that's going to be this term here, right? But, I, but now I need to average over the value of the coin weight, which is why it's going to be integrating over 0 and 1, and that's going to be this quantity. All right, so now we can form a little recurrence. All right, so P, T, D, T, that's going to be the probability that the accepted, I said theta here should be P, 
is in the region T to T plus DT. And you can just work out, you can, you can relate this quantity back to itself. Okay, so this probability is the probability that I just straight out accept. But then there's that pesky like recursion step. So with some probability, which is 1 minus ZS, which is this term here, I recurse and I start over. And then, of course, the probability that I accept on the next try is PT DT again. So if you, if you this is a bit informal, <clears throat> but uh, I didn't want to spend too much time on it. If you solve this, then you get this, which is exactly, what is this? This is exactly this term divided by Z of S. What is Z of S? Z of S, Z of S is exactly what you need to divide by in order to make this thing normalized to 1. So it's a probability density. All right, so this operation, the, the, the computation performed by this while loop <clears throat> has exactly the effect of you know, shrinking or lifting these functions in order to iterate to 1. All right, so indeed we have a, a, agreement between Bayes rule over here and this informal calculation. So in particular, the probability that the accepted x is equal to 1 is equal to this. So, <clears throat> so what, is, how, what, is this <clears throat> what does this represent? Well, <clears throat> the actual number of heads in my data set was s over n. That's the empirical frequency. And the Bayesian solution to this with a uniform prior is that <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the probability that uh, my prediction is a 1 is going to be s plus 1, n plus 2. So I don't take the empirical frequencies um, at, um, at face value. I smooth them a little bit. And I, I shrink them back to 1 half a little bit. All right. And if that effect is coming through the prior. If I were to shrink this prior away, um, uniform, if I were to shrink its probability mass away from 1 half and kind of make its probability mass uh, shove right up, right up against 0 and 1 in a particular way, basically by taking beta distributions for alpha and alpha as alpha goes to 0, then this, this would converge to S over N. So there's a limiting belief that I could have where I get back but that my, that my belief about the probability of 1 is going to be the empirical frequency. But when I have this uniform prior, I do a little bit of smoothing. So that's a Bayes estimate. Okay? So <clears throat> S over N, that would be maximum, maximum likelihood. That would be like the classic frequentist um, unbiased minimum variance estimator. Uh, this one is smoothing. It's biased. Uh, but <clears throat> if you actually believe... If you, if you, if you, the, 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 the basic optimality thing that you get by being Bayesian is if your actual uncertainty is represented by a uniform distribution, then this is the best prediction relative to your own beliefs. Okay? And on average, you're going to be beating the frequentist. Of course, they might have a different prior. And so you don't, this is not a contradiction. <clears throat> All right, so um, I'm going to. I'm going to pause briefly in case there are any questions, and then I'll give a slightly more interesting example. Yeah? So, the accepted x This part here? Oh, this, you mean this part? Um, so slightly confusing, this is my fault, which is that this derivation was from an older version of the slide where rather than reporting the probability that xn plus 1 is 1, you, you make a guess, a 0 or 1 guess as to what xn plus 1 is. All right, so it's like I say 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and you say 0. You should. All right. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> That's the probability you're guessing one is, uh, one is the next one, right? So in this particular case, it's s plus 1 and n plus 2. So there's 1 s, so you're going to be 2, two sixths, or no, 2 sevenths. Okay, so you're slightly more likely to guess a 0. <clears throat> All right, well, with, oh, yes, what's up? Uh, you need a lot more data for that to happen. So you need, yes. <clears throat> so you can you can make a frequentist study of Bayesian uh, procedures, or you can just ask about what happens under uh, uh, a lot of data. 
So, so there's two approaches. You can imagine, so I set a prior, and I have a data generating process, and so I can imagine from my own beliefs generating an extremely large data set. And then I can ask myself, hey, in these hypothesized worlds where I'm getting a lot of data, what happens to my beliefs? Well, you have a posterior, and unless something's really screwy, that thing's going to be uh, collapsing at a rate 1 over square root of n. You will have seen that rate yesterday a lot. Um, <clears throat> uh, and you can make a frequentist analysis, which is, OK, I'm not going to ask, like, on a, uh, like given a, a, a sample from my, my own distribution on data, I'm going to fix a particular element in the family, and I'm going to generate a lot of data from that one. I might ask uh, slightly different questions, like, does the posterior converge there? So the basic difference is, in the Bayesian one, I sample a parameter. It's a random variable. And I ask whether the posterior converges to this random parameter, the one that generated the data. So there's a general results that say that happens with probability 1. So if you believe your own prior, you should be good. Frequentists are a bit more skeptical. They want to say, OK, I'm gonna, I, I want to be the case universally true for all possible values of that parameter. Is it the case when I, when I generate a large data set that my posterior converges almost surely, or in some other weaker notion, to, say, concentrate almost all of its mass on a, a ball. So, you can, so you, can, you, can, you can talk about weak conversions to a point mass. That's one that's notion of, say, consistency. You can talk about the rate at which the posterior mass concentrates around the, the truth. That's about posterior concentration rates. You can talk about the shape of that distribution. That's like Bernstein von Mises type of things. Um, <clears throat> And if you're strict Bayesian, all this is hogwash. Um, but I think in practice, because uh, the models that we're writing down are not are just uh, models, and all models are wrong, uh, it's, it's kind of sensible to understand how they behave under, uh, under sensible data that you might think are reasonable. But you have to be careful, because there's a lot of papers that say, start with a Bayesian model that says, with probability zero, this happens, and then they do pick something in that set, and they show that something bad happens. And I'd say the only, th only thing reasonable about those types of, that type of work is that maybe it's not so obvious that the model said that this was a, a zero measure event. All right, so I'll press on. All right, so we just talked about inferring the bias of a coin that's meant to, understood to be directing, uh, this bias is direct, or this coin weight is directing a sequence of IID trials. So here's a slightly more interesting example that kind of plays more with uh, the ability to uh, have distributions represented by code. Um, and also, I can leave these things running for you know, an hour to get a few pretty pictures. All right, so the same computation. All right, and now I'm going to ask you this question. How many objects are in this image? All right. Now I have to tell you a little bit more about uh, how I generate images. So this. Uh, this screen here is one, two, three, four pixels wide and four pixels tall. There's only, uh, I think, eight colors, maybe. Um, uh, and so <clears throat> I can show you a few images drawn from the prior on images. So here's one. Here's another one. Now, you know, so how many, how many, how many, uh, how many, uh, how many objects are in this image? Three. <laughs> Anyone else have a guess? Does no one think two? I mean, surely that's the best answer. Anyway, so, but now maybe I reveal to you, ah, it was three, and the guy in the back was right. Um, <clears throat> so I thought two. So, so the guesser, how does this work? I mean, you, and you can invent these things, and I guess the utility is going to come down to, uh, well, I mean, this is a toy. So, I'm going, so I want to have some number of objects that's unknown. I'm not going to fix the number of objects. It's actually, I want to ask, how many objects are there? It's like a common sense task, right? So I'm going to put a, just choose a <clears throat> pretty generic distri prior distribution on the natural numbers, geometric. <clears throat> Something like 1 half, it's 1. Um, maybe it's 0. Uh, 1 quarter, it's the next number. <laughs> 1 eighth, it's the next number. I think it starts from 0 in this case. All right, then what I'm going to do, now that I've chosen how many objects there are in my world, I'm going to randomly choose their position, so this rectangle, 
um, which need not actually be one pixel thick. That's just a coincidence that everything I generated was one pixel thick in one, in one dimension. And then I randomly generate co uh, colors. All right, and I'm not showing you some pieces of code that I wrote here, because um, you can imagine what they would look like. And then I'm going to return this triple of number, number of uh, objects, their location, and their color. And then what is my checker? My checker rasterizes. It renders this set of blocks and colors. So I actually literally wrote, like, this is coming from, this is coming from my Python code. Um, I wrote raster blocks and colors that produces the image. And then I'm going to, sorry, this code produces the image. And I check to, check to see if it agrees with some particular image I'm trying to decipher. So if I want to ask the machine, hey, how many objects are here? I'm going to say, generate an image and compare it. Right? Now, what, I mean, what can I do with this thing? I can say, well, I can ask what value of k is going to pop out here, say. And that's going to be the machine's uh, inference as to the number of objects. Right? So I did that. Um, actually, let me show you a, a bit more diversity in terms of images that can be generated by Guesser. So here's, here's a few. Okay? Those are a few. So that's a big mess. All right, so when I ran on this, <clears throat> and I ran it, I don't know, 10 times, these were, these were the, uh, so these were, these were the number of times it reported uh, two blocks or three blocks. And that was it. Ran a bit longer, you start to see the tails of this distribution creeping in. Um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I'm, we're probably far from getting a, as price, precise a picture of this distribution as, say, we were in the, the, the binomial case, right? So there's some structure here. But yeah, it should be two. And OK, I'll give you th three as uh, possible, but much less likely. <clears throat> uh, then so you know, here's a bit more fantastical example. I didn't actually code this one up. So I might <clears throat> sample a bunch of spheres uh, conditioned on their overlapping. And then maybe I somehow have some code that shrink wraps this into a mesh. That's my guesser. What's my checker do? My checker passes this to a 3D rendering in image, 3D rendering engine renders it on a blurry background, and then does like a fuzzy uh, pixel-wise comparison with an actual image. All right, so then we're interested in the other direction. So I hand you an image, and what, what, is, what is this computation going to do for me? What, what, what inference is being performed by this machine if I, if I hand it to query? What's that? Uh, well, let's say the checker returns the mesh. Right, so what is it doing? What can this machine, I haven't implemented it, but what, what could it do if it ran in, you know, if it ran faster than the burn, sun burned out? That's right, yeah. So it can take an image and hand you back a 3D, 3D mesh. Now, like, would you expect this to work well? There's a couple things that are going to be problematic. One, um, it might be astronomically unlikely to generate something that's close enough to be accepted. That's the first thing that's going to kill you. But let's say you have a super fast machine. Like, <clears throat> what would you expect to see if you like went around the other side of this bunny, right? Would it have like introduced another leg? What do you think? Is there any reason to expect it to have introduced a leg, another leg? Now, like, what would you have to do if you wanted it to to uh, have a leg on the other side of the image that you hadn't seen? What would you, what would you have to do? What kind of change would there? Right. That's right. So you'd have to modify the the guesser would have to have some notion of like symmetry or something like that, right? Et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that's you could cook in that stuff. Now, you know, I, I uh, this example, I, I, I did, I came up with this example in like 2012, and I seriously thought this was like fantasy stuff, but like people are doing this now. Not. Uh, not obviously using this computation, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of approximations that have to go into the inference problem. And calling it Bayesian is a bit of a stretch too, but it has Bayesian elements. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, in limited ways, you can infer meshes from images, and um, <clears throat> and I'm less certain about say how much they know about geometry. But there's a lot you can do. You throw a lot of data at a problem. You could potentially learn. And, the, and so we'll get to this later. Maybe at the end, if someone reminds me, I can return to this problem, and I'll ask you again, how would I set this up so that I could learn about symmetry rather than having to cook it in? Okay. So at the end of this, you should maybe 
uh, you should maybe be able to venture a guess how, that, how you would do that. I have a very specific idea in my mind. Maybe there's multiple ways, but I have an idea. All right. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, to, to, so I, you know, I've, I made this point several times, but just to make it abundantly clear, query is not a serious proposal for an algorithm. Um, it just simply denotes the object we're after. Um, but still, we can analyze it. <clears throat> so how efficient is query? So if you have a procedure model that represents some distribution P, and we have a predicate that, uh, say, uh, represents an indicator function 1A, then in expectation, this computation is going to re repeat itself one over PA times. And each time, every time through, it's going to be uh, performing the computation uh, that is involved in evaluating this. Right, so then you just flip this around. Well, if, uh, if, if checking your model is efficient and uh, the probability of the evidence is not too small, then actually this thing is efficient. And I mentioned this thing called the proximate Bayesian computation earlier as like a framework that sits kind of parallel to this kind of what I'm talking about here. And the basic idea of ABC is extremely clever ways to take the predicate that you actually care about and modify it so that this probability of A gets appreciable so that you can just brute force this and, and get reasonable samples out. And the basic idea is that, yes, the moment I start playing with the predicate A, I'm going to start modifying the answer I get out. But if I, if I can find the directions along which the, the aspect of the answer that I care about is insensitive, then I can really blow up the size of the set A and make it big, but not do too much damage to, my, to the query I was actually after. So there's like a, a large literature on um, <clears throat> what's the right way of relaxing this predicate A so, so that this probability is larger. And then the implicit generative models and variational inference stuff doesn't work anything like this at all. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so I wanted to give you a, a, just one more. This is you know a bit of a, 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 an aside about how uh, how you might perform the computation underlying query. Uh, and I'm just going to I'm going to describe uh, an algorithm called. Markov chain Monte Carlo, that's a, it's really a framework, not really an algorithm. You have to kind of, uh, in, uh, for every problem, you generally have to kind of invent it from scratch for your problem. Well, the, 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 the thing that my colleagues and I did was in, uh, come up with a version of MCMC that worked on programs directly. And I'm going to describe to you kind of very high level. I'm not going to dwell too long on how this works. So here's a little piece of uh, probabilistic code. What's it do? Well, the, the interesting thing about this is that when I call geometric P, it might end up calling itself. And every single time it calls itself, it adds one. So this is evidently going to return a natural number. Um, <clears throat> and how many times is it going to go through? Well, that's going to be determined by the, this parameter P. right? So if, if P is very, very close to one, then this thing is going to very quickly halt. I'm going to get a small integer. If it's large, it's going to, be, it's going to, it's going to loop many, many times. All right. Indeed, on average, it's going to go through like um, 1 over p, or maybe it's 1 over p plus 1 uh, 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 off by one thing. Okay, so say I wanted to, imagine I wanted to sample from this distribution, but I wanted to condition on the, um, the value I get back being less than 3. So the basic idea of these algorithms is that I, I, rep I represent that predicate as another piece of code. So this, that, that predicate is represented by um, calling, there's, there's no query here. This, this is a kind of program transformation. So uh, I represent geometric here. This re returns some natural number. But then I have explicit computation that computes the predicate. So I'm testing if a g is less than 3. If it's 1, I'm good. If it's not, 0, it's bad. All uh, right. And then the idea is that I can run this program forward. Oops. I run this for program forward. OK. <clears throat> And uh, these two red marks represent points in the recursive kind of um, uh, uh, interpretation of this probabilistic program where it hit this Bernoulli P. This is the only place where randomness shows up, right here. So that I hit randomness here, and I hit randomness here. And evidently, this program returned a 2 because the first time I hit Bernoulli P, I must have returned a 0 because I kept doing work. And the second time I hit Bernoulli P, I must have returned one because I stopped doing work. 
right? So there's only two of these, so that this, this uh, if you just reason through logic, I must have returned to two. Here is a kind of abbreviation of the structure. So I've, I've, I sampled Bernoulli, got a one, sample, sorry, got a zero, sampled Bernoulli, got a one. All right, so this is the trace. And the basic idea is, um, if you expose this, uh, this computation that the probabilistic program is doing, then another way of saying what query does is not just sample me the values, but sample me this whole structure conditioned on this whole structure satisfies the trace. So I can, I can lift from, say, uh, distributions just on the program outputs to distributions on the entire way the program ran. And now I can just ask for, okay, uh, sample me entire ways program, the program ran. So sample me these traces conditioned on the trace represents a, an accepted computation. So if I can somehow sample from that distribution, I'm good. Now, that does, I, now I've not made it easier. <laughs> That's no easier, that, 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 that modification of the problem. But now I'm in the setting where I have a complete representation of the computation, and I can start moving around in this space. And the way I'm going to move around is by changing my mind about what <laughs> random choices were made. Now, if, if there's no random choices made in some part of the code, it, it proceeds deterministically. So there's no choice there, right? And so the, the space where I land in here depends entirely on what random choices have been made. And so I can then move around in this space by reconsidering random choices. So for example, I could have landed here and gotten a one. I could have also landed here, gotten a three. And I've written, I'm writing the, the likelihoods up here. I could have gotten a, uh, say, I could have sampled a K that would, ha would have happened with this probability. Now, if only I could wander around in this space in such a way that when I finally settle down, I land at this structure with exactly this probability. Right? That would be great. All right? In fact, you can do that. And that's um, what's going to work. Now, I don't want to wander anywhere, because my predicate says you better be in one of these two states. These are ruled out. That's 3. It's too big. That's k. It's too big. So I, I actually want to sample from this space here. Right? So again, I have to renormalize those likelihoods. Right? I should be in this state with probability not p, but proportional to p, and in this state with probability proportional to p times 1 minus p. All right, so how do I do that? And again, I, I, I'm not going to dwell, but I just wanted to give you the flavor. So here, here is a countable set of states that the trace could have been in. All right, and I'm going to define a way of wandering. I'm going to define a Markov chain. So no matter what state I'm in, I'm going to tell you which state you transition to, and there's going to be probabilities associated with these. And the idea is that if I run the system many, many times, then the stationary distribution, the limiting distribution, if I can precisely tune it, I can make that limiting distribution the distribution I want. All right, so this is how you do it. You do it in two stages. This is the idea between, behind Metropolis Hastings. So you first, the first stage is uh, directed by the program itself. So it's called the proposal. Let's say I'm in this state, <clears throat> all right? then there's only one random choice. And so the only thing I can do, or the only thing I'm going to allow myself to do, is reconsider that one random choice. So I'm here because I decided to immediately halt this recursion. And so if I change my mind, I'm going to start recursing. And how far I go is going to be random. And so I go here with probability p, here with probability p times 1 minus p, here with probability p times 1 minus p to the k, and, and, and so on. So I transition randomly. right? If I had started here, there's now there's two places I could have transitioned. I could either decide to reconsider this choice or reconsider this choice. <clears throat> if, I reconsider, um, if I reconsider this choice, then I go right back to uh, one. <clears throat> if I reconsider this choice, then I transition probabilistically. I recurse some probab um, um, stochastic number of times. So anyways, this, this idea of uh, reconsidering random choices induces some transition probabilities. And the trick is that metropolis hastings rule tells you exactly how to correct these choices. So the particular corrections are, OK, if you land in this state, then transition back to this state with this probability and transition to this state with this probability. If you land over here, then transition with probability one back here. All right? <clears throat> and if you started here and you transition here or here, well, then if you transition here, you stay there surely. If you transition here, you move surely back. And I'm moving surely back from these locations because these are ruled out. These are not allowed. Anyways, when you, when you combine these two probabilities and work out what's the probability of ending up, say, starting here and ending up here, 
or starting here and ending up here or here. All right, you get these numbers. You can put those into a matrix, take that matrix to the kth power, let k diverge, and you get a matrix which has the same column vectors. That distribution is exactly uh, the, the distribution that I, well, I'm not going to go back. That's exactly the desired distribution. All right, so indeed, running this system a long time gives me exactly the right thing. Okay. All right, so, <clears throat> all right, so, so that's done. I'm not going to talk about really inference anymore. Uh, um, algorithms anymore. <clears throat> uh, but I just want to now reflect on the few examples I've gone through. So despite the apparent simplicity of this, uh, this query construct, it can capture kind of a, a surprising array of uh, behaviors. <clears throat> and we're going to now do this again going through a medical diagnosis example. All right. All right, so here we are. <clears throat> so let's talk about some probabilistic inference. All right, <clears throat> so there's going to be this running example of medical diagnosis. <clears throat> and uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to build the guesser and checker. They're going to be called diseases and symptoms and check symptoms. And they kind of, kind of do what you expect to do. So diseases and symptoms, if it's going to do its job, it better define or capture my beliefs about likely patterns of diseases and symptoms in a, in a random patient entering my clinic, say. All right, and then check symptoms is something much more mundane. It just... Uh, I've measured a few symptoms, maybe not all of them. Uh, and for the ones that I've measured, I want to make sure that they agree with the hypothesized. So th this generates a possible world of diseases and symptoms, the hypothesized disease and symptoms. And this one goes ahead and either rejects or accepts it in terms of its coherence with reality. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so how might this diseases and symptoms Procedure proceeds. So, so this is uh, this is an attempt, and, I, and I've chosen these particular ways of proceeding so that the uh, structure of the distribution is going to allow us to perform some calculations later. Um, um, but it's worth considering, like, how would you make this better? And it's not hard to imagine ways. All right. So I'm going to have uh, eleven diseases that I'm interested in. Here they are. <clears throat> And under my prior, I'm going to assume, and this is not a great assumption, but it's a typical one that you see made all the time, which is that, all right, my patient is going to have each of these diseases independently with these probabilities. So I'm going to flip a coin, and 6% of the time, my hypothesized patient is going to have arthritis. 11% of the time, they'll have diabetes. One thousandth of the time, they'll have MRSA. Okay. All right, so that, that's the starting point. Okay, so we've, I, I, I've just given you, uh, I'm not going to write down the code, it's just kind of um, arduous, but you can imagine how you would write code to do this. All right, so, so I've now <clears throat> sampled, a, <clears throat> I have now produced a, a length 11 bit vector indicating absence or presence of diseases. <clears throat> All right, so now I have to figure out symptoms. Symptoms are slightly more interesting, right? Because symptoms come from diseases, but maybe different diseases lead to the same symptoms. So how am I going to deal with that dependence? <clears throat> so the solution uh, that I've taken here, and it's a classical one, I'll, I'll make the reference later, is that for each symptom, I'm going to start by sampling uh, an independent binary random variable for each one of these. And these are the probabilities that are going to be associated with these, each of these symptoms. And I'm only considering seven symptoms. <clears throat> so for fever, this variable is going to be, uh, say, one with 6% probability. Insulin resistance, at 15% probability. So what, what do these represent? LM is, if, the, if LM for some particular symptom, and I'm talking about one patient here, by the way, I'm, this whole time I'm just talking about the symptoms and diseases associated with one patient. So LM is, is, is if LM is one, that means that for no particular reason, there's no disease, there's no causal link to a disease, this person is spontaneously presenting this symptom. All right, so this represents the possibility that there's an unexplainable symptom. It just comes from nothing. That's LM. All right, and then, then I'm going to introduce this array of variables. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's the water here for. <clears throat> this array of random variables, C, N, M. So N is indexing diseases, M in indexing d symptoms. And I'm going to, for, every, for this one patient that I'm talking about here, because I'm only talking about one patient at the moment, I'm going to flip a coin for every single entry. Okay. You have to be willing to be wasteful in modeling. 
All right, so, uh, so what does this mean? So, for example, this entry here is relatively high. That means that this variable is likely to come up 1. And this variable, C51, if it's on, then this says, well, if you do have 5, then 5 is certainly going to cause symptom 1 to appear. All right, so C stands for cause. <clears throat> All right, now how do I put these together? All right, so I start off saying we have the Ds, the D, D1 up to D11. These indicate whether you have an underlying disease. You're not going to see these, usually. And now I'm, now I'm get, telling you the computation that you perform in order to, in the model, to ter, decide that this person is going to present some symptom M. Well, you're going to present this symptom M if you've decided to spontaneously present it, or there's a max here, right? These are all 0, 1, so a max is like a logical or. So you'll present the symptom if you spontaneously do, or if you have disease 1 and 1 causes d symptom M, dot, 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 you have disease 11, and um, you've, you, um, it is a case that 11 will cause M. All right, so we have this, no we have this or structure here. Having a disease then probabilistically or stochastically might then cause you to have a symptom, and there's also this leaky possibility of getting a symptom, so they call this a noisy or. All right, and what is SM? SM is indicating whether or not the patient presents a symptom. Now, now you're starting to see where this can get complicated. If I present a symptom, like say a fever, where did it come from? If I just tell you you have fever, there's any number of diseases that might be causing fever, it could also, they, they could be simultaneously causing it. One of them could be causing it alone. It could be caused spontaneously, et cetera. All right, and this, this uh, multiple, the, the possibility of a, of a patient having multiple diseases simultaneously and uh, spontaneous symptoms and also symptoms caused by disease is what really makes di you know, performing diagnosis dif difficult. All right. <clears throat> So I've walked through all these terms, I think. All right, and then so diseases and symptoms, it has a, it has a type signature of a checker, so it has, it's going to return to me some, something I'm going to check, and what it's going to hand me is a sequence of diseases and a sequence of symptoms. All right, and my checker is going to focus, I mean, I could, I could look at any of this. I, can, I, can, I might want to perform any number of conditional um, inferences on this vector of random variables, but I, we're going to focus for the moment on checking symptoms. All right, so that's my diseases and symptoms. <clears throat> and uh, so I, I can run this. I, it's a piece of code, so I can run it. I'm going to run it eight times. So here are eight patients. All right, now, what does it mean when I ran it, ran it eight times? Well, those were eight runs. They were independent. And so these are like eight randomly chosen people that entered my clinic. So uh, one and two, no diseases, no symptoms. Three here, so this person's, I can, you know, there's no chance for you to remember what these were, but... I'll just tell you, so, uh, uh, sorry, it's actually, sorry, sorry, it's, oh, I've messed this up somehow. Anyways, so suffering from diabetes, presenting insulin resistance, dot, dot, dot. All right, <clears throat> so this is obviously a very toy model, uh, but it's actually, uh, it's actually based upon an, an actual model called QMRDT, uh, which was which has hundreds of diseases, thousands of findings, and was maybe one of the first kind of real successes of bringing probability to expert systems. So the expert, you know, if, if you've never heard of expert systems, I wouldn't really uh, think less of you. They're sort of like an idea that uh, as time has passed. These were systems that were largely hand-engineered rules, right? If-then-else statements uh, crafted and like carefully kind of uh, kept secret because, you know, if you saw my if-then-else rules, then you might steal my company or something. Uh, so instead, this is a very different approach. Instead, you have this, uh, you have, in instead of rules telling you how to go from symptoms to diseases, you just have this uh, probability distribution which generates out of thin air situations, typical situations, and in the tail, less typical situations, but still more typical than very un atypical situations. Um, now, I mean, of course, you can look at this and, and uh, point out a whole bunch of issues. Diseases can cause other diseases. Symptoms can cause diseases, et cetera. You could modify this program and introduce more sophisticated mo modeling choices, et cetera. Right? And, the, and, and then generally in practice, the things you're up against are, well, you might have made your computational problem harder. Um, uh, um, 
Uh, and, generally, you, and, and generally, you actually want to kind of resist uh, coding these things by hand. You, you, what you really want to do is bring some higher level abstract knowledge and then data together, and we'll, and we'll, we'll get there a little bit later. Okay. So let's talk about this. So we've got a few more minutes before we'll have a break. All right, so <clears throat> let's, uh, let's start by considering the predicate that accepts if and only if uh, you present the first and seventh symptom, uh, and you're agnostic as to the other ones. So you've measured the first and seventh, and it better be the case that you agree on these two that you've measured, and these happen to correspond to fever and sore neck. All right, so this is, so check symptoms, making sure that this is a set of hypothesized diseases and symptoms such that you definitely have a sore neck and, and, uh, and fever. All right, so what does query, what does query do? All right, well, it's going to sample from the conditional distribution on other symptoms and, other, and, and diseases, underlying and explaining necessarily what happened, why these, uh, well, actually, I guess in these variables, they, you don't actually explain, but, um, <clears throat> sam but though I guess if I wanted to have an explanation, I could have included the C variables in here, and that would not only in tell me what diseases there were, but also posit a causal explanation for what was actually causing what. Right. So that's another thing, right? So I can just add some variables in, and I, now I have enriched my set of inferences I can make. <clears throat> All right, so, you know, I've already, and I said we can, we can just run it, right? Well, actually, already with 18 binary variables and checking two, it's not so bad. Um, I think I've actually run this one. But if you wanted to check a, a bunch of these, then this thing is going to get slow fast. And you're not going to be able to use this, like, this very simple uh, accept, uh, guess and check thing. You're going to have to actually go and... Um, read how to do probabilistic inference uh, efficiently. But anyways, just to remind you, so what is this guess and check doing? Well, if I let mu denote the output distribution of diseases and symptoms, and I write A for the sets of uh, tuples of diseases and symptoms where I am observing sore neck and fever, then query had better be generating samples from this condition distribution. So in particular, S1 and S7 are B1. And then all the other one, the bets are off, but they better, they're going to, they're cor going to correspond to likely ways the program ran, given that it generated a sore neck and a fever. All right, so we're going to study, we're going to study this uh, conditional distribution a little bit, because it will ex expose a couple of kind of quintessential aspects of Bayesian inference, especially in this kind of causal ex explanation setting. All right, so uh, the starting point, again, is to um, ask, how do I get out of this loop? That's like the basic question about thinking about the query construct. How do I get out of the loop or think about the likelihood? So I'm going to consider some assignment to the, the, of, the, um, of the diseases. Uh, and I'll kind of bunch these diseases up in a vector d, and I'll just write d equals d for the event that all the diseases match some particular fixed set of diseases. <clears throat> and something that I say might be interested in is what's the probability that this particular collection of diseases um, is underlying these two observed symptoms? All right. <clears throat> all right, so what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to use a particular structure of diseases and symptoms. If you recall, I sampled the diseases independently at random. I sampled all the spontaneous probabilities, the Ls at random. I sampled all these causes at random. Also, all these variables were independent, so it has very simple probabilistic structure. Any event that happens up here is just a, a multiplication of events. And then I had these derived events, like a symptom happened if this collection of any one of these collection of events happened. So that simplifies the calculations. <clears throat> so I want to I ask about this uh, probability here, and this is sort of in the backwards direction, right? If I had this program and you had a set of diseases and you wanted to understand what were the typical symptoms, you could probably just go into the code, fix the diseases to be exactly what you wanted, and then run the rest of the program. That's not hard at all. The hard part is running the program in some sense backwards. You get the, you get the, I'm telling the settings of a couple output variables, and then I'm asking you to hypothesize the likely settings of earlier variables in your program. So that's in, it's in that sense, you're kind of running the, the program backwards. So the, the types of things I can calculate much more easily are, like, say, the probability of the diseases taking particular values. So those were independent. And it's not too hard to calculate, say, the probabilities of particular symptoms arising given diseases because of all the independence that went into design, designing this model. And the basic trick we're going to use, not really a trick, really, these pair of identities. So 
when I define the conditional distribution of A given B, I could have defined it, say, I, I, could, I get this identity, and the, de the definition of mu uh, B given A is, uh, gives me this identity. And then if I look at these two and, and shift stuff around, I get Bayes' rule. All right, so Bayes' rule allows me to take, um, allows me to answer an A given B, or like a D given S's, in terms, of B, uh, in terms of the other direction, so in terms of S's given D's. All right, so Bayes' rule allows me to take the easy calculations and re-put them together in order, to, in order to get at the harder, harder calculations. That's the main conceit. All right, so again, so let's fix some collection of diseases. All right, what's the probability that check symptoms is going to accept? All right, so the first thing you notice is once I fix those diseases, then actually whether these symptoms accept or not is totally independent, right? Because this depended on a spontaneous probability for that symptom one. That was totally independent, the spontaneous probability for symptom seven. And all these causes were totally independent, right? Because I, this, whether, I, whether something causes symptom one was totally independent of whether some particular disease was, was going to cause symptom seven. So these two probabilities factorize, and, that, and we'll, we'll return to that later. This is evidence of conditional independence, right? And, that's, and you can just see that from the functional form of SM that that's going to happen. These variables are, that are indexed by M, they're not used by anyone else. The only variables that are shared are D1 through D11, and I'm, and I'm conditioning on those. So for all intents and purposes, they're fixed and not random. So you can work out, it's not too hard, and I'll, I'll share these slides later if you want to go through the calculations more carefully. It's not too hard to calculate what is, say, the, the probability that some particular symptom, M, arises given a particular setting of the D. I've written this way, which is representing the idea that SM is equal to zero, which is the opposite of the event here. So I have one minus, and this is the probability of the symptom not showing up. So it doesn't show up if I don't spontaneously construct it, and for every single possible disease, that is actually there, I don't cause it. All right, so if you take all those numbers that I showed you a few slides back in the tables and, and, and plug it in, you can go ahead and, and, and using, say, sorry, and using, uh, using Bayes' rule, using the probabilities of the diseases which are in the table, and using um, this formula here to calculate likelihoods, you can plug all that in in order to calculate these ratios of posterior odds. And then the reason, and, and this, is a, this is a pretty standard trick in Bayesian statistics, why am I looking at posterior odds? Well, if I look back at Bayes' rule here, Bayes' rule has this uh, uh, pesky uh, normalizing constant. And so if I take a ratio of two things that are conditioned on the same thing, so I'm conditioning on B here, going now forward two slides where I was, I'm conditioning on the same event here. So I can avoid calculating the probability of this end, that's tricky because I have to imagine all possible ways that these two symptoms could have come up. There's a combinatorial number of those. I, you want to avoid these types of calculations, and so the trick is to look at ratios. These two ratios both have that normalizing constant, and they cancel each other out. So I can do this, in a, you know, as I did this when I did this calculation, I could do it on pen and paper. All right, so <clears throat> you rewrite that ratio using Bayes' rule. You go back to the tables. You use these equations, and you say you can calculate something like this. All right, so now so let's get back to intuition here. I can say, OK, given these symptoms, how much more likely is it the patient only has flu um, versus has no listed disease? That's 42 times. All right, so this, this simple model is telling me that, well, if you have, a, if you have fever and, and sore neck, then you are 42 times more likely to have only flu than you are to have nothing. It's actually trickier to say, you have flu, and I'm not going to be. I'm going to be agnostic to the other diseases because that requires one of these very expensive uh, sums over all possible other worlds. All right. All right. So that's a pretty strong. That's pretty strong evidence that uh, you don't have nothing. All right. Because there's already already something that's 42 times more likely. All right. So at the very least, you have the flu. Um, you can say compare no disease versus meningitis. So meningitis is already six times more likely than no flu. Um, but if you compare, say, meningitis and influenza, then probability, you know, probability theory is logical, so you're going to get seven there. All right, so flu is way more likely than meningitis. All right, so these are the types of, you think, these are types of uh, judgments you can get out of the system, right? and which, which can lead you to a di diagnosis or a decision about how to administer medicine. I'm not going to be talking about the decision-making aspect of 
things. Now, how about uh, having meningitis and influenza? So, this is uh, this lead, so thinking about this leads to an interesting phenomenon called explaining away, and I just want to talk about this. So I can I can look at this ratio. So I have the same evidence, and I'm going to say, okay, what's the probability on the top that I have meningitis and influenza versus I have meningitis and I am I'm not sure whether I have influenza. I have not measured it, all right, but nothing else. Okay, so these. These, the only difference between these two is that this one is, is, uh, has observed influenza and this one has not measured it. Uh, so which, you can actually move some of these things. Because, they, because these things have uh, share some things, you can actually move the meningitis over here. And that means the same thing. So this is saying, this, this boils down to, what's the prob this, this ratio boils down to the following. What is the probability I have influenza given that I certainly have meningitis and I have a sore neck and fever. So what that probability is, the probability that I have, on top of meningitis, I have flu, okay, is equal to, not quite, but almost exact same as your prior probability that you have influenza. Okay, so it's worth thinking about what that, what that means. <clears throat> so, the probability you spontaneously came up with influenza, that's the same as a judgment as you, you have meningitis, what's the probability you also have flu? Now flu is an explanation for sore neck and fever. But what's going on here is meningitis already explains those symptoms. And so the model does not need to find another explanation. And flu is sufficiently unlikely on its own that it's too costly to posit that it's piling on and explaining symptoms which you've already explained. All right, so that's the second observation here. And that phenomenon of explaining away is kind of fundamental. It's also actually related to the reason why calculating these um, probabilities in the system uh, can be computationally um, hard. And there's also another observation just to mention here, which is subtle and I'll get to later, which is also, this is close to but not exactly equal to uh, the prior probability, and so actually, while the diseases were independent of each other at the get-go, once I've observed some symptoms, now the diseases are coupled and they're dependent on each other. Like for example, say if a symptom can only be produced by two diseases. Well, if I tell you you don't have that disease, then you certainly have this one, right? So that's an example of dependence that can arise. That is very painful computationally and it's, and, and, and it's related to why these things uh, are hard to compute. All right. Um, let me just remind myself uh, where I am. Okay. Um, all right. So this is just you know this is just a it's just a couple quick points. One, th this is a very simple model, but already kind of leads to this interesting interesting behavior. All right. Um, and uh, and you can get kind of a wide range of behavior just by playing with the predicate. Like for example, the predicate that we were studying before was just saying sore neck and fever, but I haven't measured anything else. That's quite different from sore neck and fever and everything else doesn't exist, right? That's a different diagnostic kind of standpoint, a st different standpoint from performing diagno diagnosis, right? And if you had learned a rule which forced you to tell me the answers in every single symptom, then I, had, and then I would have a system where I'd have to figure out some kind of ad hocery in order to figure out how am I going to call this procedure which wants me to know whether uh, this blood test is uh, true or not or came, came back positive or not, right? I don't have to do that with this. Um, if I run some diagnostic, say, that almost surely tells me that I have meningitis, then I can add that to my evidence. I have men I, I, or I do not have meningitis. These are my symptoms. I've me measured a bunch of other symptoms. Now what? Right? So there's a rich set of questions I can ask this model. It's not like learning a classifier where I put an image in and get a label out. It's a bit richer. But also, of course, learning something like this, which we haven't talked about yet, is, is also more ambitious. All right, um, <clears throat> and then finally, of course, I, you know, there's nothing constraining me from asking backward-facing questions. I could ask forward-facing questions, like, "Oh, geez, I think they have uh, whatever this is, M MSRA. What else might? What other symptoms might we be looking for?" You could ask the model to imagine future symptoms that you might be might want to look out for. Okay, or you can do kind of weird things, like I, I want, you know, there are at least two symptoms present, or the patient doesn't, does not have both salmonella and tuberculosis. That, can, might be a, that might be like a, a piece of side information you know. Something rules out that logical possibility. 
All right. All right, so just to wrap this section up, <clears throat> uh, I've shown you query, and in this simple di medical diagnosis stuff, I've shown you some inferences that we performed. There's been no learning yet. So inferences means that I have a known distribution on a collection of random variables, and we've been looking at how, they, how these var variables, kind of uh, how observing some of these varying variables tells me about how others change and, and, and modify my beliefs. Right? Um, and then just, just to highlight, the inferences that we're making here are fixed. No matter how much data I have, I'm still going to be making the same predictions, right? Even if I move to some setting where there's much less flu, like California or something like that, I'm still going to be thinking and using the probabilities I learned in Toronto. Uh, so, uh, so in the next step, we're going to be talking about how you can start using data to inform these inferences. Uh, all right. So let's take a break. <laughs>